It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. Prophecy is best understood looking back. This is what Jesus said. When these things happen, then you will know uh, that I have spoken them. And so, um, the, now some of what we're going to say now is a little bit of a review. When you talk about the book of Revelation and we study Revelation, most people think it's a revelation of the beast or the mark of the beast or 666 or Armageddon or some of these hot button words primarily revelation is a revelation of Jesus and all the different pictures in the Bible are giving different perspectives they're like the facets of a precious jewel that are reflecting different facets of Christ in some way Jesus appears through a variety of names and images all through the book it's helping us to better understand God. And prophecy as a whole is not designed to just show us the future. Prophecy is really, to, it's redemptive in nature. Prophecy is to redeem. Because if you understand all the details of prophecy and what all these different visions represent and you're not saved, what good does it do you? Ultimately, prophecy is there to redeem us. Maybe we should review what some of the primary purposes for prophecy are. Prophecy, of course, gives us evidence for the existence of an omnipotent God. Secondly, prophecy gives evidence demonstrating that the Bible is reliable. One of the first things an evangelist will do to uh, introduce a seminar is he'll take prophecy because nothing will strengthen your faith in the dependability of the word like Daniel chapter 2 or one of these prophecies that is clearly written before it happened and then you see the fulfillment of it. Thirdly, prophecy provides evidence that there's a purpose in life. When you think about it, I mean most of us live on a very razor thin moment of the present. Everything else is in the past or in the future. And when God in prophecy tells us, I can go back in time, I can go forward in time, I can see the future as perfectly as you see the present, that tells you that things are not just haphazard, that we're not living in these um, uh, serendipity lives where they're just, there's just no purpose and no design and everything is fate. And uh, th there is a plan and that God is on the throne. Fourthly, prophecy unfolds the creator's secrets regarding how we should live. Prophecy is instructive because of how God responds in the future and even in the past. It tells us something about his nature and how he wants us to live. Now, when you think about Bible prophecy and especially prophecies like Revelation that are what we call, keep in mind the word revelation means apocalypsos or apocalypse in Greek. We think of the apocalyptic prophecies, they're the ones who are given, the prophecies that are given in symbols and signs like Zechariah and Ezekiel and some in Amos and of course um, Daniel, Revelation. Why does God use all these signs and symbols? Why doesn't he speak plainly? Well, these symbols are given for one thing because you have to read the rest of the Bible to unlock prophecy. Uh, it's filled with symbols there and keep in mind John was a prisoner of Rome in the salt mines of Patmos there Rome was going to be destroyed Revelation talks about the destruction and the evil of Rome it identifies it as Babylon and because of that in order to preserve that message if God had just said in uh, Revelation Rome is an evil empire that's going to be destroyed what would the Roman leaders think of the book of Revelation wouldn't they seek to destroy the book so to preserve the message, it's given in code. In the same way, Daniel, he in chapter 2 and chapter 7, he talks about Babylon is going to fall. So if he had just said Babylon is going to fall and Nebuchadnezzar wanted it to last forever, they would have destroyed the, the manuscript. 
So to protect the writings, it's given in code. And in the Bible, you'll find that there are symbols. And if you understand your Bible, you'll understand most of the symbols. Now, some of them are very easy for you to understand. When I say to you, there's a dragon. How many know who that dragon represents? And this is a little bit of review from last week. Revelation 12 says that old serpent called the devil and Satan, he's the dragon. Can't misunderstand that. And what it says in the middle of the throne, we'll talk about that today, there's a lamb as it had been slain. Do we have to guess about who that lamb is? Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. And so we know through the Bible symbols what that represents. But then you get to Revelation 12, there's a woman. Revelation 17, another woman. These are just prominent women, and, and they don't ever speak and say, hi, my name is Sally, and this is who I represent. You say, well, what does that represent? Going through the Bible, there are a lot of these symbols that appear other places in prophecy that help you understand. Now, this is a chart of Bible uh, symbols and their meaning, and it gives the scripture to understand them. You can get this from that website called Bible Prophecy Truth. Amazing Facts developed this website this year. I found it was just as fast for me to Google it. I just typed in Bible prophecy. On the first page out of over 700,000 possible sites, this was on the first page, it was the third website. Isn't that exciting? Would you like to see it go to first place? Then you tell all your friends, you link to it, put Bible prophecy truth at your website, it'll go to first place. Matter of fact, when you all go home from church, log on. That'll boost it in the ratings at Google. It talks about millennium and Armageddon and the mark of the beast and all these different really uh, exciting subjects. And it's got a lot of material there. But you can also get the Bible symbols and their meaning. You can print this out there. Bible numbers, remember we told you, certain numbers appear many times in Revelation. Those numbers also have a meaning. And you can look at that. So that's one reason the symbols were given, to protect the message. I remember during World War II, I don't remember because I wasn't alive, but I remember reading in World War II. Um, my dad was in World War II, and then we lived among the Navajo Indians in New Mexico, and many of them were code operators because the Japanese had broken every American code, and um, they said, we got to get something else. And so there was actually the son of a missionary who had grown up on the reservation and he was in the Marines and he went to them and said, I know the answer for your code. So you just need to draft some Navajos. It is the most difficult language. My father's been working for years to try and translate the New Testament into Navajo. It is the most complicated language and it doesn't follow any rules. So the cryptographers can't decipher it. Let them talk to each other on the radio and they'll never figure out what they're saying. Well, they did some tests and said, you're right, we can't figure it out. And so what they did is they had Navajo radio operators scattered throughout the Marines that were the communicators. But not only would they communicate with each other in Navajo, they were given coded messages they'd communicate in Navajo, and they'd use these pictures. And they'd say, oh, we've got 15 tortoises coming over the hill and they knew among, and they'd say it in Navajo, those tortoises meant tanks. And so they had, you said, oh, they've got, um, you know, a bunch of uh, crows flying in or something like that, and that, that meant planes. And so they had all these different things that they give the code in the language and that further complicated it. So sometimes to understand Revelation, you not only read what it says in Revelation, you go to other places in the Bible you find out what the symbols mean, and then you look how were they used back then. So we're going to do a little bit of that this morning so you can just understand why we're studying it the way we study it. So these symbols all had meaning. Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, verse 10, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it's given in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. So some of the enemies of Christ, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14. One of the best ways to understand prophecy is the Holy Spirit and the Word of God will give you understanding. You know the people in the world, when they hear some of these evangelists start explaining prophecy on TV, they think they're on drugs, don't they? 
And you probably have thought that too. And matter of fact, the way I've heard some interpretations, I think they're on drugs too. I mean, let's face it, you've heard some really squirrely ideas about prophecy and revelation in particular. But when you have the Holy Spirit and you're comparing scripture with scripture, here a little, there a little, line upon line, it begins to click. There's a consistency, there's a science to it, but you still must have the Holy Spirit to understand it. Revelation, we ended last week reminding you it's a book that you will be blessed in studying. That is not just something I'm saying. The book itself says it. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. Matter of fact, he says the words of this prophecy and keep the things that are written therein for the time is at hand. So it's telling you in the opening chapter there's something to do about what you hear. Blessed are those that keep. So you're not only to read it and understand it, you'll be blessed if you keep it. Blessing at the end of the book makes it clear also. Revelation 22, 7, Jesus said, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy. And so there's a blessing pronounced on those who hear it and keep it. You'll be blessed in studying it. Can't keep it until you read it, right? Amen. So that's where we've got to start. And these are the words of Jesus. Notice, the time is at hand. It starts the book by saying the time is at hand. It ends the book by Jesus saying, Behold, I come quickly. So Revelation covers a time span from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus. And of course, beyond into the eternity. It takes us beyond the millennium into the uh, time of eternity after the 1,000 years. Now when we left off, we were talking about the sevens in Revelation, and in particular, the seven churches. This represents seven stages and ages. And those churches represent cycles that a church may go through from its inception until it sort of atrophies in Laodicea. It represents an experience an individual may go through. Many people accept the Lord and they're like Ephesus and it's all about theology. They may even lose the first love and people can be at any stage along the way. But most, most of all, this represents the cycle of time Seven, when you think of seven in the Bible, where do you find seven? What does that number mean? Where does it first appear? In creation. Matter of fact, first time any number appears three times in the Bible, it's the number seven. It says on the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. In Revelation, in Genesis chapter two. It's a cycle of time. A cycle of time. The seven churches represent the cycle of the church's history from the first coming to the second coming. Now the book of Revelation has a lot of sevens in it, but there are three prominent visions of seven. You get the seven churches, the seven seals, we'll probably get into that today. Then you, you've got the seven trumpets and you've also, uh, there's also seven plagues. The seven churches represents the spiritual history of the church from the first coming to the second coming. The seven seals represent a political history of the church from the first coming to the second coming. The seven trumpets represent, don't they blow trumpets in battle? Doesn't Paul say, giving the trumpet a certain, certain sound, they know how to prepare for the battle? Military history of the church from the first coming to the second coming. But the prophecies of God are not flat and single dimensional. The prophecies of God, and when you study Revelation, you need to think it is multi-dimensional. You will find that one prophecy, while it will perfectly give you, for instance, the, like I said, the cycle of the church's history, there's a lot of depth to it. You know, I might speak to you, and I'm just, I've got one meaning in what I say. I'm a mortal. We're kind of, we kind of speak and think on one dimension. We're more linear in when we communicate. God's word is not confined or restricted the way we are in our communication. God can say one thing that is so profound that it is truth and it does not conflict with the other meanings but it has multi-dimensional meanings to it. I always like to go back and take Jesus for instance. The disciples come to Jesus and ask him a simple question. 
When will these things be? Jesus had just referred to the destruction of the temple. And um, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? Matthew 24. They kind of asked him three questions. He then gives them this incredibly deep and profound answer in Matthew 24. You'll also find in Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. That's where you find his answer. Explaining the signs about his return. In that one answer, without carving it up for us, he answered those who were living that day what they were asking. What was going to happen to the Jews? He also told the church what they could expect in their history. So every Christian in any age can read Matthew 24 and it was relevant to them that day. He talked about the great time of trouble the Jews would go through just before Jerusalem was destroyed. He talked about a time of trouble the church would go through during the age of Thyatira, a great persecution. And he talked about the great time of trouble before the seven last plagues in the end of the world for those of us living in this generation. One answer, many dimensions to that one answer. Now how many of you already knew that? Read Revelation realizing that God's word is not restricted the way we think. And I think everyone here knows there's more about Revelation that I don't know than I do know. It is a book of God. It is so deep and it is so profound that there are people who have, I heard one uh, Leslie Harding, a uh, theology teacher at Andrews, uh, dear man, he said you can't even begin to understand Revelation until you've read it 50 times. Just some of these great minds I remember Joe Maniscalco, I was his pastor, he was an art teacher, traveled around teaching Revelation. They had his Bible at his funeral. He had absolutely worn out the top 70% or 20% of his Bible and Revelation just worn the pages right off. He had read it through so many times. And so for us to do this overview of Revelation, I'm just trying to whet your appetite. That's all I'm doing. I'm not gonna be able to give you all the answers for these things. You realize that? I'm making I'm trying to create within you a desire to make you want to study it. Because if there was ever an age when these things are applicable, it's now. I mean, now is the time for us to understand these things. A lot of it has happened in the past, but there's still a lot of it that's going to concentrate in the last days. All right. To the seven churches. Uh, let's put that map up there. So we've got these seven churches, and they're the churches of Asia. John was a prisoner in the Isle of Patmos from Rome. This was not all the churches. Why just those seven? Supposedly John especially ministered to the churches in seven. He took Mary with him, the mother of Jesus, when he moved up to Asia Minor. And uh, ostensibly her house is there. I believe it's in Ephesus. And uh, he can look right across. The messages in the churches, you, they go in order as though you're going on the mail route. They had roads. The Romans, you know, had good roads. And you could go from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum or Pergamos to Thyatira to Sardis to Philadelphia to Laodicea. That would be the end of the route. And so it's almost like he has a bird's eye view as he's doing this circle. There's a, an incredible um, sequence and order that's given. Now the seven churches, and I'll name them for you, each word has meaning. And each church has a unique characteristic. You've got Ephesus. That means desirable. This is the church that had lost its ardor. It had lost its passion for Jesus. They love the truth and they love the doctrine, but when you've got the doctrine and you don't have the love, you can become legalistic. And so the Lord commended them for their passion for the truth and that they were trying to maintain the discipline and the holiness of the church, but they were losing their first, that initial love. Then you've got the church of Smyrna. This is a church that was persecuted. And the word Smyrna, it's related to the word myrrh, which is an incense or fragrance. And it was like their lives were an offering. This was a time of great persecution that the church went through. Then you've got the church of Pergamos or Pergamum. And that was heights or elevation. This was the tolerant church. Thyatira, it means perfume. It was the age of compromise in the church. That's synonymous with that woman in Revelation chapter 17. Mentions Jezebel in Thyatira. By the way, all the proper names in Revelation are symbolic. That's a pretty sweeping statement, Pastor Doug. 
all of the proper names in Revelation are symbolic. The numbers have a value that is real. There really were seven ages of the church. There really are 12 foundations in the New Jerusalem. There really are 12 different kinds of fruit. And so, see what I'm saying? When it tells about the size of the New Jerusalem, real numbers, prophetic ages that are given in Revelation, there's a value. That value means something. It's just a, not a nebulous, ethereal number. But the names are spiritual. When it talks about Balaam, and again, I mentioned this, you got to go back in the Old Testament to know what's it talking about, or Jezebel, or it talks about Apollyon, or some of these other things. Then you've got uh, Sardis, Prince of Joy. This was a nominal church. Had a name that you live, but you are dead. Then you got Philadelphia, the age of brotherly love, the church that was doing evangelism and missionary work everywhere. And the final age of the church, Laodicea, and that means a judged people are the judging of the people. Uh, we are living in that final age of the church. It was the lukewarm church. Had a, you know, figure they were rich and increased with goods, like that man in the parable in uh, Luke, feasting sumptuously on the truth. We've got the truth, Jewish nation, time of Christ. We've got the truth, feasting on it, beggars laying at their gate full of sores, desiring the crumbs. If we're not sharing with those that are lost, then we've got a problem. All right, so that represented the message of the seven churches. Now, you transition from God talking about the condition of the church below, then all of a sudden, and go with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. It's real important that we read this because you're going to run into it and if you haven't already. Verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice that I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things that mu must take place after this. And so he, he goes through the churches and he says, Now I want to show you in a special way things that must take place. A lot of our evangelical friends, not all of them, but a lot of our evangelical friends read this, and when he says, Come up here, they write down next to that rapture. So they take everything from chapter 4 on, and I told you last week, that's where it gets the name futurism. They say this is all in the future because you don't hear the word church mentioned much until you get down towards the end. That means the church is caught up, it's out of the world. And everything else that's happening in Revelation is happening beyond our time. I think the devil loves for people to think that because Jesus actually says the time is at hand. You're supposed to trace chapter 4 from the time of John on to the time of the second coming, and they take it and they toss it all off into the future just because he said, come up. Because it says there's a voice like a trumpet. They said, that's the trumpet of Gabriel. I just the trumpet just means loud there. Trumpets announce things. Trumpets not all equated with the second coming, the voice of the Lord like a trumpet, Trumpets in the Bible had to do with crossing over the Jordan River when Jericho fell. Trumpets had to do with uh, military decisions. So I, I think it's really a leap in logic to say because he said come up and they hear a trumpet, that means that this is now the second coming of Jesus. Everything else that's happening in Revelation is in the future. Another important principle when you study Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is not given in chronological order like you might write down your autobiography. I was born while I was very young, you know, and then you, you go from there. In sequence, this happened this year and this happened this year and you do it sequentially. The way that prophecy works, it goes like this. And the Bible's written like this. First, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he takes you that far. He says, now let me back up and tell you what happened when he created. And he goes like this and he takes it a little further. He says, now I'm going to tell you about what happened on the sixth day when Adam couldn't find a wife and he started looking around the animals weren't going to work. And then he goes back and he says, now let me give you the genealogies of Adam. And he backs up and it overlaps. It keeps going back and it keeps going overlapping. It's not written sequentially. Daniel chapter 2. How many of you sort of understand that covers the history of the kingdoms of the world? And when you get the end of the Daniel chapter 2, that's the end of the book, right? No, he covers the panorama of the world's kingdoms through this one vision. He says, now I'm going to show you the same time period, 
but I'm going to use another vision. I'm going to go around this side, and now we're going to talk about a goat and a ram, and then we're going to go over here. We're going to talk about a lion and a leopard and a bear, and backing up and covering a lot of the same territory in layers so there's no question about what it's saying. And let's face it, some of us like to think about it in the metals. We're, you know, we're tangible. We like the minerals. We like Daniel chapter 2. Some of us, we like animals. We like to think about the lion and the bear. God gives it all in different pictures so that if you don't get it one time around, you might get it another time around. And so it appeals to everybody. And so when you're reading through Revelation, it is not written sequentially. So my heart breaks for these dear people that get to chapter 4 and say, that's all in the future. I don't know what's going to happen. And they can't, they're missing so much. I'd like to study Revelation 17 with those people because you can't read that without saying, wow, or Revelation 12. It fits perfectly with history. How can they miss it? Much of it past history. And so a lot of dear people say, come up, all he's doing, he said, look, I've shown you things that are relating on earth. Now I'm going to take you off into heaven and I'm going to give you a vision of how heaven is dealing with what's happening with the church on earth. And all of a sudden he's brought into this throne view in heaven. I looked and behold a door standing open. He says, I'll show you things that must come. And I was in the spirit and I beheld a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Why is he in the spirit? Because God's a spirit. And angels are ministering spirits. He's surrounded with spiritual things, so he has to be in the spirit. It's, so before he's on the Isle of Patmos and he's kind of looking across the Aegean Sea and God is showing him this vision of Jesus among his churches on earth. Now he's showing him Jesus interceding in heaven. And so that's all that's meant there. And it tells us, I saw a throne. And one sat on the throne, and he that sat was like Jasper and Sardis in appearance, and a rainbow around his throne. He begins to describe God the Father on his throne, and God the Son is described in the same chapter. You go to Daniel, there's only a couple places in the Bible you find God the Father and the Son, and it talks about two thrones. Daniel chapter 7 has that in that great judgment scene. I saw the Ancient of Days, and one like the Son of Man was brought before him. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus, then who's the ancient of days? Must be God the Father. So here you've got this picture of these thrones in heaven. And then it talks about around the throne of God, you've got these creatures. You've got these four beasts around the throne of God in, um, in Revelation chapter 4. Um, Revelation chapter 4, it says, And the first beast was like a lion. The second beast was like a calf. The third had the face of a man. The fourth was flying like an eagle. Now, you know, that's exactly like what you're going to find in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10. To understand Revelation, you've got to go back. Ezekiel 1, verse 10. The likeness of their faces, for they had four faces. Of a man, the face of a lion. The, they had the four, they had the face of an ox, the face of an eagle. So there's a consistency here. Ezekiel makes it sound like there's four creatures, and each one has four faces. And in John makes it sound like there's four creatures and each one has one face, but they're all different. What does this mean? Is God surrounded with all these strange, alien-like creatures in heaven? First of all, Jesus appears in chapter 1 with a sword coming out of his head. Is Jesus going to come and you're going to see him? He's holding a sickle. He's got a sword coming out of his mouth. Holding the sickle means he's harvesting the earth. What does the sword represent? Use the Bible, Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Ephesians chapter 6. The word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So no question about what that sword represents. In his mouth, what was in the mouth of Jesus? The word of God. So when we go up to say hi to Jesus in heaven, we try and give him a hug. We're going to have to dodge a sword sticking out of his head. Or is it a symbol? So, so many of these images and creatures you're seeing, you say, what does that mean? All right. What do you think of when you think of a lion in the Bible? Well, lion represents Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion is a picture of strength in the Bible. It's a picture of majesty and um, of power. 
And you think about an eagle. It represents swiftness. God says, I bore you on my wings as an eagle does her young. Eagles, their sight, they can see. They're like all seeing. They, nothing escapes an eagle. It sees everything happening. An eagle up on his spot, he can look all the way around him and see. Then you've got a calf. These were humble creatures. They were animals of sacrifice. They would labor. And then you've got a man and all the dignity of man made in God's image. You know, the best explanation I've heard of these four creatures, they represent different aspects of who God is. You notice they're around the throne of God. They're telling us something about God and his character. The four gospels I've heard identified with these four creatures. Why did God give us four different gospels? Same story, all a little perspective. I have heard Mark compared to the eagle. It is the quick gospel. Uh, have you ever noticed you read the book of Mark, how often it will say, and immediately, and straightway. It is your summary. It is moving, bang, 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 very fast. By the way, it's the shortest gospel. It gets right to the point. It's the eagle view. Then you got the book of Matthew, which is the lion. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is shown to be the Messiah, the king, the lion of the tribe of Judah. All through the book, it's referring back to the prophecies that prove Jesus was the king. In the book of Luke, what was Luke's occupation? He's a doctor. Jesus is portrayed as the son of man. And he often uh, has a more human perspective in Luke. And then in John, Jesus is shown to be the great sacrifice, the lamb of God or the calf. And so each one of them is giving these different perspectives. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but um, it goes all the way back to Aristotle that people are divided up into four primary char character characteristics. And, and most uh, psychologists um, really agree with this principle. You've probably heard it before. Melancholy, sanguine, phlegmatic, and caloric. Now, it doesn't matter what word you use, and I'm not, there's nothing sacred about those terms. People typically are divided among four major category personality groups that can have different breakup. And some are kind of a mixing of all of those things. But we've all known people that have these different emphasis in their character. Who's going to live in the New Jerusalem? Church. Church is composed of how many apostles were there? Twelve. How many gates on each wall? Each wall has three gates, twelve total, right. And it's kind of telling us that we're all sort of a composite. On the breastplate of the high priest, Jesus appears as the high priest in Revelation 1, there were twelve stones, and were they all the same? Were three of them the same? You weren't so sure. No two of them are the same. Are they all precious? They are. They're all different. God's church, he's not a cookie cutter up in the sky where all of you have to act exactly the same. We all have a little different personality and different gifts that all must be sanctified by Christ. You know how many different combinations you can get when you've got 12 times 12? 144. We're all unique. You can probably get 144,000 out of that. Anyway, so you get these four creatures around God's throne. And now they're in the middle of this vision. It talks about there's this scroll that appears that has seven seals on it. It's a mystery scroll with seven seals. And they're wondering who's going to be able to open it. Oh, by the way, you know what I jumped past? I forgot to talk about the 24 elders around the throne. I knew this was going to take longer than I thought. Where'd they come from? 24 elders. I thought that you don't get to heaven until you die and your, the resurrection takes place, and yet you get 24 elders, and they seem to be human. Well, for one thing, when Jesus died and rose, doesn't it say there in Matthew 28, and many of the graves of them that slept were opened, and they arose? and they appeared to many. And so this can be some of the first fruits of the people that came with Christ to heaven. Why 24? Have you read in the Bible that it says here in Revelation, we are to be a nation of kings and priests. By the way, 
please remember this. To understand Revelation, a lot of it is written in the context of the great Exodus. The Exodus was the history of the Israelites. It was the backdrop for everything they believed in, that God had called them his chosen people. The whole Exodus experience, God in their midst, the Ten Commandments, the covenant, the deliverance from slavery. It's all salvation, isn't it? Well, God says he called them in Exodus to be a nation of kings and priests. And by the way, the ten plagues that fell on the Egyptians, you find seven plagues that are very similar in Revelation. Knowing Exodus is going to help you understand uh, Revelation. There's a lot of similarity. Well, you read in 1 Chronicles 23, it talks about 24,000 were appointed to work in the house of the Lord. There was a circuit of 24,000 priests during the time of David and Solomon that worked in the temple, the Levites, that rotated. And David had an army, 1 Chronicles 27.1. The divisions came in and went out month by month throughout each division having 24,000. So you've got 24,000 among the priests and 24,000 among the officers and the military. Priests and kings. By the way, Jesus appears in Revelation as a king and a priest. Can you think of another king priest in the Bible? Melchizedek. It says there's this king and this priest. He appears out of nowhere and he disappears. Doesn't tell when he's born, who his people are. Doesn't tell when he died and where he went or where he's buried. Without beginning or end, he's a type of Christ from eternity to eternity. Melchizedek, the king and priest, who appears there in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. The king of Salem. Salem was the abbreviated form of Jerusalem. Salem means peace. Jerusalem. This king, priest, and he's the uh, Melchizedek means king of Melchiz. Mel means king. Dizek, righteousness, king of righteousness, who was the priest and the king, king priest of the Most High God whom Abraham even gave tithe to, and it says he brought out bread and wine. What does Jesus do at the Last Supper? Our king priest makes a covenant with us. What are the emblems of the covenant? Bread and wine, that grape juice and that bread. It's just fantastic. And so all of this is in company. The 24 elders, well, there's two sets of 24 in the Bible, in the leaders and in the priests. And so, uh, kings and priests. All right, now I can go to the seven scrolls. Now, you've got these, this scroll that appears here in Revelation chapter 6. And there's a lot of concern because it's in the right hand. Right hand in the Bible, a symbol of favor. But nobody is found worthy to open the scroll. And so there's a great consternation in John. It says, he wept much. This is he, you ever just been dreaming all of a sudden something happens in your dream, you can't even understand why, but you're overcome with a sadness, a profound sadness in your dream. And I, I've woke up before when I just get this tremendous sense of sadness, I almost felt like sobbing. And John just realized if this scroll cannot be opened, the world is doomed. And there's a great sobbing because this scroll not only unfolds the future. By the way, do you know how you and I live in the future? If I were to tell you you're going to do all your living right now in the present, and that means your life's over as soon as the present goes by. If you don't have a future, you don't have life. Does that, am I going, am I confusing you? Are you aware that in two days, tomorrow will be yesterday? Now, that's pretty deep, isn't it? <laughs> you with me? <laughs> this scroll is a scroll of prophecy. Prophecy is about the future. It's about life. It's about eternal life. And if God can't open this, if no one can open this, we have no future. Some have compared it with the book of life, but to be more accurate, it's really about prophecy. You read in Isaiah 29 about another scroll that can't be opened. If you want to understand Revelation, the rules are can't make up your interpretations. I've heard some preachers, they just say, I think it means this, and you think, where did he get that? Because that's how we felt that day. That's not fair. You can't do that. We'll all have different interpretations. They're called private interpretations. They're deadly. 
Let the Bible interpret itself. Find another scroll in the Bible that's sealed and you, you, you'll start to get the clues. Isaiah 29, 11 and 12. The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. He's talking about a vision, a prophecy, which men deliver to one who's literate. This person can read, and they say, read this, please. He says, I can't because it's sealed. Well, there's one person, he says, I won't read it because it's sealed. Then they'd go to another guy who's illiterate and say, please read this. He says, why are you asking me? I can't even read. So I hear they're making all these excuses for saying, we can't, we have no power to open this sealed book. You either can't read or it's sealed. So we need someone else to open it. By the way, you read in Daniel 12, verse 4, if you want to know what this book is, let the Bible interpret itself. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Now what does that mean, seal it till the time of the end? Doesn't that say that at the time of the end it won't be sealed? At some point it's going to be open. When? The time of the end, it's no longer sealed. Until the time of the end, it is sealed. And by the way, more of Revelation has come to understanding during the last age of the church of the time of the end than any other time in history. Great knowledge. Prophecies best understood looking back. And a lot of it's behind us, and so it's been unsealed to a great extent. And so this is also unsealing our future. Revelation 22.10, he said, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. So it's talking about the book of Revelation is about to be opened. That's what's sealed with those seven seals. The truth is about to be revealed about salvation, about God, about the battle between good and evil. Amos chapter 3 verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants of prophets. So through John the prophet, he's revealing his secrets to us. And so then they say, Do not weep, John, for there's one who can open the book. Now I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter 6. And here it, it, it tells us about what he sees. I'm actually in Revelation chapter five, uh, 5. He said, don't weep. Verse 5, one of the elders said, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Do we know what that lion represents? The root of David. He has prevailed to open the scroll. Prevailed. Why prevailed? means there was a struggle. He struggled with the devil. He has the right, he lived that sinless life, to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, by the way, this is why this sermon takes so long, I keep saying incidentally, by the way, do you know there was a sealed scroll that was given to a man that had his own death sentence in it? Uriah was handed by David a message given to Joab that contained the death sentence of Uriah even though he was innocent, he had to die to cover the sin of others. And he delivered his own death sentence in a sealed scroll. Jesus, that lamb that was slain, is the only one that had a right to open that scroll. Because for you and I to understand these things, for us to have a future, for us to know the vision, he had to die to give us this information. Does that sort of make sense? you spiritual things are spiritually understood it made sense to me I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain it stands but it had been slain when Jesus rose did he bear scars that he had been slain yes but he stood having seven horns horn in the Bible is a symbol of power if you were a shepherd when they anointed a priest, they poured the oil out of a horn. It meant the power of the Spirit. These nations, these kingdoms were re represented as horns in uh, Daniel chapter 8. So he's got the seven horns, he's got seven eyes. That represents knowledge, knowing, which are the seven spirits of God. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it talks about the seven characteristics of God, the Spirit, such as wisdom and power and knowledge. And you'll find that in Isaiah 11, verse 2. So this is Jesus who, accompanies all, who encompasses all that. The seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The gifts of the spirit are given to all. And he took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Okay, now here you've got Jesus the lamb and someone who sits on the throne. Can you see the father and the son in this picture? 
you got the lamb taking the scroll out of the hand of one who sits on the throne. And now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang, here you get the incense, so we know what's happening by that altar of incense in the temple. They sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And you've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. There you have the kings and the priests again that we found in chapter one. We are the nation of kings and priests but you notice it's not just Israel. Out of every nation and tongue. Now this was very important to those that were reading because now you get to chapter seven and it says there's 12,000 out of 12 tribes. Oh, before I get there, now let's start opening the seals. I'm going to try and make it to chapter 7 anyway. So they fall down, they worship. They say, worthy is the Lamb. You find that uh, exaltation and praise gets mightier and more expanded several times in Revelation. The praise and the worship songs become greater crescendos than the one before. Finally, they open the seals. Now I saw chapter 6, verse 1. The Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with me, come and see. So when the seals are open, he sees, he understands. It's a revelation is what's being given in these seals. And he said, he opened, behold, a white horse, and one who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now you find later in Revelation, a rider on a white horse, and it's Christ who is the Word of God. This represents how the Word of God triumphed in the first centuries of the church. There's a parallel between the seven seals and the seven churches. One is giving spiritual history, one is giving the political history. Again, a summary, I want you to study. Three, he opened the next seal. Now you get the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Here we go. By the way, this is a picture by Joe Maniscalco that I was telling you about who worn out Revelation in his Bible. Uh, and, you know, this is an artist's conception. I don't know if it's exactly what John saw. Probably not, but it gives you something to look at. So then the next one you've got is this um, red horse. And he said to him, take peace from the earth that they should kill one another. And there was given him a sword. So then you've got this age of great persecution that comes to the church. The third seal he opens, he says, come and see this black horse. He's got a pair of scales in his hand. He hears him say, a quart of wheat for a denarius and a quart of barley for a penny. A denarius is a penny. Do not hurt the oil and the wine. This is a symbol for the preciousness of the word of God during that time. It had become so scarce and it was eclipsed. Barley was the cheapest form of food. It was given to the animals. Usually they gave wheat to people, barley to the animals. Number seven, he opens the fourth seal. You've all heard of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They are simply the first four of the seven seals. Opens the fourth seal, and I heard the fourth creature say, come and see, as I looked and behold a pale horse. That word pale there, any of you know what a root looks like? When you put a potato near the cupboard and it gets a little bit of sunlight and it starts sprouting these pale roots because they're not getting any real light. They're not green. It's like a deathly color. That's what it's saying. It's like this deathly pale color. No chloroform in it. This pale horse, a time of great death and, and persecution that comes to the church. This is synonymous with the period of persecution of the dark ages. And then you read through the seals and then he goes on and uh, he opens up the fifth seal and it talks about those who had been slain for the word of God. You've got these sign saints that are under the altar. Now, how many of you think that there are people that are saints that are saved that are crying right now in heaven? Who would want to die and go be under an altar and cry? How many of you know that's a symbol? Some have tried to use this to talk about the state of souls after death in some kind of purgatory or Abraham's bosom and they made it literal. It's not literal, it's a symbol of how God's saints that have suffered during this time, their day of justice is coming, be patient. 
When you read in the Bible, when God says, the blood of Abel, God said to Cain, the blood of Abel, your brother, is crying to me from the ground. Was the cells, the little blood cells going, help, 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 from the ground? Or is, was God just using a metaphor there that we all understand that his blood was evidence that justice needed to be taken care of? And so here is a time where there was great persecution of the saints and that there's a cry that is going up because of the prayers that had been recorded. Now, do you know that you can pray a prayer today and you might die and that prayer is recorded and the answer may come after you die. Let's say you're praying for your children and you might die before you see their salvation or conversion. Are those prayers stored? Or does God say, no, nope, you're dead now. I'm, those prayers are all wiped out. If you die in your faith, he records those prayers, doesn't he? And so these are all the saints through the ages. Their prayers are under the altar. What was on the altar? The prayers of the saints. We just read that, didn't we? It's talking about their prayers for justice and vindication and deliverance. There's not a bunch of souls under the altar crying. It's their symbols. Is that clear? Oh, let me at least get through the sixth seal. I'm going to have to start with the uh, 144,000. So it talks about the, the sign saints and then it transitions to the wailing wicked. You go to the sixth seal, 12. I'm in chapter 6, verse 12. I looked and he opened the sixth seal and behold, there's a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. By the way, there was a great earthquake in history during this time. And the moon became like blood and the stars of heaven fell to earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. And the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled together. Now, you know what I'd like to tell you? We're living historically between verse 13 and 14. A lot of these things have happened historically. The great earthquakes, a dark day, the moon looking like blood, the stars appearing to fall from heaven. Along the continuum of history, these things have happened where God's people, his church, prominently could see this. But ultimately, when Jesus comes, the sky will recede as a scroll. These things are going to happen again in quick succession at the second coming. And every mountain and island is moved out of its place. The way things are happening with uh, earthquakes right now, you wonder. And here's the wailing of the wicked. And the kings of the earth and the great men by the world standard and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men, the people who have the power down here, in other words, that are persecuting God. And every slave man and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains. Are these the saved or the lost hiding? Because the, the saints aren't going to run. It's the blessed hope for them. This is the wailing wicked. And they say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who will be able to stand? Now, typically... When you have a nightmare and you see some monster, are you, I, I know some people are terrified of snakes. And uh, I remember years ago, and I don't recommend this, but this was a long time ago, I went and saw this movie Jaws. I was not a member of the church back then. And I'm a scuba diver. I was afraid to get in the swimming pool in Palm Springs. <laughs> Because, you know, after all, a you know, great white shark could spook you. And I know some people that are terrified of spiders or bears or you name it. But I never heard a person say, I've got this phobia of lambs. I'm so scared of lambs. I mean, doesn't it sound like an oxymoron to say the wrath of the lamb? They're considered the most loving and gentle creatures. And uh, who was that? Uh, they had a children's program for kids, and she had the little puppet lamb chops. That's back in the howdy doody days. <laughs> yeah, and because it was innocent, it was cuddly, but it talks about the wrath of the lamb. Why does Jesus, why is he pictured that way? Because when we see that God gave his lamb, his son, that everyone could be saved, and he poured out his blood to save the world, that whosoever believes in him might be saved. And after we've trampled on that sacrifice, 
If we reject the mercy of the Lamb and the sacrifice of the Lamb, if we reject everything good the Lamb has left, the only thing that is left is the justice of the Lamb. And you realize the penalty for sin is not just death, it's punishment or wrath and death. And so, and the wrath of the Lamb later is shown in the seven plagues that are poured out. And so here it's showing these two groups. One group that is gonna be saved and God says you're gonna be vindicated and then he immediately goes to the other group, they're persecutors. He's got the persecuted and the persecutors. As we enter the last days, friends, you realize everybody here is gonna fall into one of those two groups. One group is gonna have the whole world mad at them and they're gonna be persecuted. They'll have the seal of God. You will be saved. God is promising you, hang on. Your prayers will be answered. Then you've got the other group that's living for the world now and they're not thinking about eternity. They're the wicked. They're the persecutors. They'll get the mark of the beast. When we get into the next section, it's then going to identify those that are singing, that are standing on the sea of glass, that are redeemed. The, the victors, the 144,000. Are you being at all encouraged, hopefully inspired, tantalized to study this book more, I hope? to get to know what's in the future. He said the time is at hand. There's a blessing for those who read here and keep the things that are in the book. I want to be fulfilling all three categories. I want to read it. I want to hear it. I want to keep it. Don't you, friends? There's a blessing for those. Let's pray for that blessing now. Dear Lord, Father, you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. And we are so thankful that we are given the privilege of worshiping you that's what it means, worth-ship. And Lord, we pray that uh, we can live lives that will bring glory to you. We pray, Lord, that we will have our eyes open, that we'll have the discernment to see what is at hand right now. And if ever these things were at the threshold, if ever these things were about to be fulfilled, we know right now we're in the midst of the fulfillment of the most climatic of events in this book. I pray, Lord, that you'll awaken us to the time in which we live. Help us to be roused from our lukewarm condition and to be receiving that eye salve that our eyes might be open, those white garments that we might be clothed, and that gold that we might be rich. Bless us, Lord, that the things in this book will not just be symbols, that they'll be reality in our lives. Be with every person. I pray that you'll fill us with your spirit. Bless us in our fellowship. And again, we thank you for your goodness. Help us be ready when the Lamb does come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org.